Hey guys, it's John, and I'm here today at the North Carolina Arboretum. It's uh, a beautiful January day. The, the, it's just gorgeous out the windows here, and I am really glad to be with uh, Mr. Arthur Jure, the curator of the collection here at the North Carolina Arboretum, and he's going to work on a tree today for us. Um, so welcome, Arthur. I'm glad to have you as a guest on one of my videos. Uh, John, I've been watching your videos for years. <laughs> great. Glad to well, be here. Well, thanks, thanks. What, uh, what are we going to work on today? Hey, have a seat. Um, this is a tree commonly called Persian parodia, or Persian ironwood. But like a lot of common names, it's misleading to call it an ironwood because it's, it's not a carpinus. It's not, uh, it's not truly an ironwood. The botanic name for it is Parodia persica. It's a plant that's native to Iran. And um, it's commonly, not real commonly, but it's out there. You can see it in public gardens and such. It is uh, used as a landscape plant because it has a lot of um, botanical interest, you know. Here it is, wintertime, and although it doesn't show uh, a whole lot at this moment, it has exfoliating bark. And so sometimes, you know, you got the plates that peel off and you get multicolors, like right. you do with stewardias. Right. And so it has that feature in the winter. Uh, it, it's a member of the uh, witch hazel family, all right? So it has those same kind of flowers, okay. only instead of being uh, yellow or orange or red like witch hazels are, it has a, like a magenta color to it. Not real showy in the landscape. You can see it, but it's not a, you know, a spectacular floral display. But uh, I mean, if I ever get it to flower like it can as a bonsai, it would be really, really I bet neat. It would. I bet it yeah. Would. And then the, the leaves look like uh, witch hazel leaves, and they get great autumn color, you know, oranges, reds, so even like purple touches to it. Speaking of autumn color, I think this tree has a little history to it. That's right, yeah. That was, uh, it was used as the logo tree for the 2008 Expo. And so that was a popular image because it had a cat. A black cat. Yeah, yeah the black a, cat. The 13th Expo. That's so, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so it showed this tree in autumn color and the black cat. It made a nice image. It did. Um, and, you know, this, this came from Felton Jones. Ah, uh, right. Of course. Yeah, everybody in the South knows Felton. Uh, and he was a great friend to the, to the Arboretum, to us when we were, uh, particularly when we were working towards getting our, our garden built. And uh, Felton gave this to the Arboretum sometime, I would say, in the late 1990s. And it was in a, a plastic nursery can, and it was about six, seven foot tall. Oh, wow. And he gave it to us as a tree that he thought we would put in the landscape. And it had, uh, you know, it had a nice base on it, and then uh, it was a tall thing, but it had one low branch, and one day I looked at it and made the choice to cut it. And if you look right here, it's completely covered over now, because among the other winning features of this plant is it covers wounds really well, you know, so that was a big cut, and it covered over, and this was trained up to continue the trunk line, and, you know, you can see here in profile all the, all the places it was grown and cut, grown and cut, grown and cut. And so since Felton gave it to us back in the late 90s, it's never been in the ground. This was trained entirely in a container, you know, and it was in a box to begin with, a big box, and then it went into a bonsai pot, and it, it was shaped up to be a pretty presentable bonsai, and, and like we mentioned, it was the 2008 logo tree, but then uh, something happened. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, it happens, right? You grow plants, sometimes uh, there are bad years, or good years and bad years. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, what's your plan for today? What, what you're going to do today? Well, once it, once it was set back, you know, it, it lost some limbs, it, uh, it had died back, the plant was still alive and healthy, but it was not presentable anymore. So I took it out of the bonsai pot, put it into this wooden box, and it's had two years to grow in this box now. And you can see the resulting regrowth. And I pretty much just let it go, right? You know, you can see up here in the top that at some point last, last uh, summer, I was having trouble keeping it 
hydrated. You know, it was it was drying out and right. flopping in the middle of the day. So I came along and just did some approximate cuts, right. just to take off some really long shoots up high in the tree where I knew I wouldn't really need them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's the only pruning it's gotten. Now it's healthy and and, and vigorous, and it's time to bring it back under control. Great. I notice you're pruning off some of the bigger stuff and leaving some of the smaller stuff. Why do you do that to develop branches? Well, I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for a place I can cut back to that has an existing part that can then be trained to carry on the line of the branch. Same way that we do with the trunks, you know, whenever you cut back, you're looking for uh, a branch that can then be trained to continue the, the line of the trunk in the same process in the, in the branching. And so, you know, I'm trying to picture how this branch will be put together and how different parts of it can be trained to form the, the shape that we want for the branch. That's the part of uh, bonsai that's, that's very enjoyable to me personally, but I could also see where, um, you know, depending on the person involved, it, it could be uh, a really challenging thing, uh, a difficult thing, is envisioning when you have something like this, or you've got lots of parts, you have lots of options, and you have to make choices, you know, this will work, and this is not as good as that, and, and so forth. And that part of it is uh, the creative side, you know, Absolutely. that's where you're actually deciding what your tree is going to look like um, in, in large measure. And... Uh, of course, as soon as you make that snip, you, you know, <laughs> that decision's made. <laughs> the uh, creativity's occurred. It's nice, you know. I, I really like working with deciduous trees, right? Because I like the look of them. I, of course, I like coniferous things too, but deciduous trees uh, are more common here where I live, and so um, I'm more familiar with them, and I, I really enjoy their seasonal changes and so forth. From a bonsai perspective, one of the great things about deciduous trees, uh, most of them that we use for bonsai are capable of growing new growth on old wood. Right. And so if you get to a point where you have a branch and it's in the right spot, but all the parts on it are not where you want them to be, theoretically you can cut it back to just the branch or you, know, you could cut it back to just the trunk and then new sprouts come out and you can, you know, you can work from there. So that aspect of deciduous trees, I think, is, is a great positive that you, uh, you, know, you can pretty well count on a lot of regrowth when you do pruning and even new growth off of old wood. So when I, when I cut a heavy branch, I want to do it in two stages, you know. I want to cut off the main part, you know, the weight of it, and then come back and do a better finish cut, uh, you know, where you can line it up so that in the end, after this covers, it'll be a natural transition. It'll look like the branch just grew that way. I think a lot of people don't, uh, it takes a while to learn that, that you have to do this to create taper in a branch, otherwise you end up with a branch. Even if it has move, movement in it, there's no taper. That's right. So by cutting those back and, and picking a smaller branch, uh, you, you build that taper into the trunk, so, or into the branch. Well, agreed, agreed. And you know, you and I have, have talked frequently about bonsai, so I know that uh, we have similar views on a lot of it. And uh, to me, that's, it takes time to do that, right? It takes a, it's a really long, protracted process that builds that taper in, builds that movement in, and it's not uh, off-putting to me that it, it is so, that it takes time to do it, you know? And it makes people, you appreciate it more when you see it well done. That's right. right. Well, over all that time, one, you're enjoying the plant as you go along. It's not like, oh, I can't enjoy this until it's done, right. you know, until it looks like a bonsai. You enjoy it every step of the way. You know, as you're growing it, you get to know it, and, and you learn. You make mistakes, too, yes, but, 
you, you learn how the plant grows and what you can expect in response to the things that you do. And, and, and that familiarity with the plant is uh, rewarding. Absolutely. It, it's, I've, it's, I've found that in my collection, I enjoy the growing, developing part as much, if not more, than the, than the refined piece once it's in a, in a bonsai container, so. Yeah. Well, it's the doing, mm -hmm. you know? It's the doing of it that's enjoyable. It's nice when you put your plant to a show and, and collect compliments on it, if that's what you collect. Um, it's nice to have people respond favorably to your work and all that, but the real satisfaction comes from the doing of it. Absolutely. I notice, I, I see, it looks like you're um, nowhere on there where you pruned it. Do I see more than two branches coming out at any one spot? Is that something you, you think about when you prune? Yeah. You mean like uh, having something... A third one coming off? Yeah. Um, yes. Look, I, I learned bonsai largely in the, in the Yuji Yoshimura school, right? right. Um, he, was, he was my earliest teacher and, and certainly the one that left the biggest impression on me. And I know you've been influenced by him as well. His book, you know, has influenced so, lots and so. lots of people. And even now, as, um, you know, I'm branching out and doing things that he probably wouldn't have agreed with, still, in my mind, my reference point are the things that he kind of uh, categorized as the step-by-step -step process, right. you know? And that aspect of having branches that don't, uh, you know, you don't have three or four points of growth at any one place along the, uh, the branch or the trunk. That's something I tried to stick to if I can. Yeah. And here again, John, using, using material like this, I know there are bonsai people who look at this and they, and, and they would say, oh, the trunk's too thin. Yeah. You know, the trunk, the base of the trunk should be three times what it is here. Six to one, right? I don't know. Ratio. I was terrible at math in school, you know, so I don't think in numbers. I think visually. And when I look at the tree, I'm, I'm feeling more than thinking. Uh, Stanley Kubrick, the great film director, said, the truth of a thing is in the feel of it, not the think of it. And that's how I approach bonsai. It's, it has to feel right when I look at it. And so... When I go out into nature and I look at trees, I don't see the trees with these huge bases. I know there are places where those trees exist. Certainly. But it's rare to see a tree that looks like that around here. Right. The trees I see, this is, this is appropriate, you know? If the crown of my tree ends up being like this, this size trunk is appropriate. It is. I don't need it to be this big. Right. If somebody likes that look, great. that's great. That's how they should grow their trees. But to say, like, oh, it has to be that way or it's not good is, is being unnecessarily limiting. Which goes on a lot, you know? It does. Not just in bonsai, but in lots of things. People have their tastes, and that's good. And then when they try to apply their taste to everybody, like, hey, you got to do it this way or it's not good, that's not so great. So, I think um, the majority of the pruning is done now. Um, there'll probably be a little bit more kind of nips here and there, because uh, what I'm going to do next is wire it and, and put the shape into it. And in doing that, you know, you make adjustments. Things are a little bit long, you head them back. And when I do this kind of um, session with the tree, I anticipate that. And so if I'm uncertain about something, I'll tend to leave it long because you can always go back and take a little bit more off. That's, that's not a problem. But basically, you know, I'm looking at it and trying to get proportions right in the pruning. And of course, you see something like this, but that's, that's going to be addressed with, uh, with wire. And this is a pretty flexible plant. I let it dry out because that increases the flexibility of it. But there are limits, of course, and there, you know, 
go too far and it'll break. I don't want to wrap with raffia or anything like that. Um, we'll work with what we have and just try to uh, refine it, refine it. But I like the feeling of this tree, you know, there's a lot of movement in all its parts. There was one branch up in here that was kind of coarse, you know, and it was a relatively new sprout, and I let it grow long to try to catch it up with the others. Well, you know, it got away from me, and it got too big, and uh, most of the branching was out here. I don't want, and you know, maybe in the end it gets cut back to this, and maybe when I'm wiring, I'll make that choice. Right now, I decided, hey, I'll cut it to here. You know, I'll cut it to here, and someday I can cut back to here. And then the branch will have more taper, it'll have more natural uh, looking movement in it. But for right now, we'll go with that much. Up in the top, uh, John, you and I were talking before about, you know, you don't want too many points of growth coming out of the same place. Well, when you get to the top, you're kind of obliged to do that, right? Uh, thematically, as you move up the tree, the spaces between where the branches emerge on the, on the trunk should be getting smaller and smaller, right? And uh, when you get up to the top, what I want to have is not a point, you know? It's, it's, this isn't a spruce tree. I want to have a rounded crown, and so... You know, yeah, this is, this is the apex of the tree, but ultimately, this part, this, this, even this, you know, and parts that don't exist yet are going to all come up to almost the same point, and they'll form that rounded crown that we want to make it look like a, an old deciduous tree. So the wiring is what comes next. Well, I think it's I think it's done for today. Um, the front is marked by these two posts in the ground. Uh, that's how I think it looks best. So when I put it into a bonsai pot and present it, that'll be how it's set up to the viewer, right? But of course, with all our trees, we want them to be uh, credible from all angles. So let's take a look at what we have. Uh, and, you know, certainly there are strong points and, and weak points. Um, and this is true with any tree. And that's exactly why I think it's, it's a, a useful thing, a useful tool to have uh, a front. Um, you allow yourself that conceit that the best way to see this tree is from this perspective. And this is how I present it. And, of course, people are going to see it from all around. But this is its primary uh, angle to be viewed. It looks great, Arthur. I think you've done done excellent work. Um, I like how everything you know. I like how all everything's been cleaned up. You've 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 taken this tree to the next step. Obviously, it's not finished yet. It's going to continue to ramify and get better. Um, a couple things I noticed. Um, first off, um, I I'm going to say I appreciate that the branches aren't all laid out like an like an old tree. Um, or like an old conifer, maybe, or a spruce or something. So what, um, what are your thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts about that, John, as you know. And uh, People don't watch hour-long YouTube videos, I don't think. So 
we'll, we'll give the shortened version of it. From a personal standpoint, and I know this is true for you too, after a while, it's not satisfying to create bonsai that look like most people's stereotypical idea of what a bonsai is. What you want to do is express your own experience of trees in nature. Absolutely. Right? So, my experience of trees in nature here in Western North Carolina, I'm out and walking in the forest every chance I get, and going up in the high elevations and seeing trees shaped by nature in, in somewhat extreme conditions, and uh, studying, thinking, taking photos, making sketches, thinking about it, and, and observing how they actually look. And then coming back and in bonsai trying to capture some of that feeling. Of course, I'm not trying to make a, a scale model of any given tree in nature. I'm trying to make a, an artistic expression of how I experience the trees. And when I look at the trees I see around here in nature, maybe they're not hundreds of years old, maybe they're just 100 years old, or, or 75 years old, whatever. But they're shaped like this tree is shaped. Not exactly. This is still an interpretation. This is still a distillation of what I see in nature, a, a kind of cleaning up, which is our human impulse when we deal with nature. But this, to me, is, is an expression of trees as I know them. And deciduous trees, their branches angle upwards. The oldest ones will sometimes lay out horizontally because they have to get out from underneath the canopy that's over them, so they have to extend way out here and carrying all that weight causes the limbs to come down, you know the whole routine, but the sun is up here, these trees grow up, up and out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's why they do that. You do that. <laughs> um, so what's the future for this tree? What's next? Well, um, it's going to go into a bonsai pot, as I said earlier. Uh, not the bonsai pot it will finally go in, because I don't own that one yet. You know, I was looking through containers and thinking about what, you know, what I'd like to see this in, and I don't have the pot. But I want to get it into a bonsai container, because just like I needed to work on these limbs and bring them back into proper relation to each other, is the roots have been growing too. And now the roots have gotten a little bit coarse. They need to be brought back in. And although it would be entirely possible to put it directly into the, the final container, or what will be the final container for the coming years, instead we'll go into something that's a little bit oversized and step it down. Because the top's not ready yet either. It's getting there, it's getting close, but uh, it's going to be a couple of years. And in the meantime, I can be stepping the roots down gradually instead of hitting them all at once with, with that. Right. Give me, wait, wait, give me your critique. Uh, you know, I agree totally, and I think the next step of this is, um, is to begin to develop the fine ramification, and I think that's going to take moving it into a smaller container, containing the roots, not letting it grow out so big, but, but being a little more on top of the pruning so that the branches don't get quite as big, and, and start to build that really fine ramification from this point. Um, I, like the, I like the apex the way it is. Um, I think... Um, I wonder if eventually this piece could be removed uh, in favor of some, it just seems a little large, but, but you know, I realize it's developing and it takes time, and to take it off right now would probably be something ugly, uh, but, but uh, I, I can see where as, that, as these branches develop more, that might be able to be removed, um, I think that would help to taper at the top. But. I agree with everything you just said, and as regards the top, and referencing back to what I was saying just a few minutes ago about studying trees in nature and emulating the way that they grow, this is, is something you don't see. Right. Uh, not in an older tree. You don't see um, a clear line from the base to the very apex of the tree. Not this clear. Right. There may be one line you can follow and say, well, that's the apex, and all these other parts come up to meet it. But generally, it's fragmented into many parts before it gets this far up yeah, to the, the top. Yeah, the top 10% doesn't have a direct line to it in deciduous trees often, so. Well, that's, that's a, um, you know, here is, is a concession I'm not willing to make. I'm not willing to cut that out and train things up from here. Not all at once. Maybe, as you say, over time, yeah. you get there and take this part out. But in the meantime, I feel more comfortable looking at it with that in there. And I can be developing these others in the Sorry. meantime. Sorry. 
Arthur, this has been great. Um, I've enjoyed uh, spending time with you, and, and uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing your knowledge and your expertise, and, and it's been awesome. Thank you. Hey, it's my pleasure. Anytime, John.